Let's play our first hymn this morning, which is number 159. This is my song, and our musician this morning is Sheila Kaloran. <laughs> beginning of a Westwood service, whether in person or online, we pause to affirm that the land where we gather has borne witness to thousands of years of Indigenous history, culture, and spirituality. Westwood's building resides in Amuskachee, Waskahagan, the Cree name for Edmonton, meaning Beaver Hills, and is located on Treaty 6 territory. It is the traditional home of diverse Indigenous peoples, including Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, and many others. Before my ancestors arrived, there were people here, and they still exist to this day, diverse nations of people who built complex societies, civilizations, and cultures, and they have over a span of many, many generations and continue to do so today. As treaty people, we are partners in the stewardship of the land we all rely on, responsible for the impact of our choices, responsible to our ancestors who came before us, and responsible to future generations. In the spirit of reconciliation and Indigenous, sorry, in the spirit of reconciliation and decolonization, I light this candle as an expression of our solidarity with Indigenous communities and their fight for self-determination. I also invite you to type into the chat where you're from if it's not Treaty 6. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Heather McLean Smith, and my pronouns are she and her. It is my honor to be your service leader this morning. I've been on the worship committee helping plot and create our Sunday services for six years. I've service led many times in our building and many times on Zoom, but this Sunday feels particularly special as it is my last time service leading for Anne. I knew I was going to cry. <laughs> Westwood is a resilient community. We are small and we are mighty. Big changes are ahead for our little Westwood. And I don't have the whole answer, but I believe each of us carries a little piece and together we will find our own way. It feels particularly important this morning to give some direct name acknowledgements. And I'm not going to be perfect at this, so please, Hold some space in your heart for forgiveness if, if you feel like I didn't mention your name and I should have, okay? Please forgive me. But I wanted to especially thank Brenda Jackson, 
Jacqueline Ouellette, and Lorian Kennedy for their decades of dedication to our beloved community. I wanna thank Susan Anderson and Maggie Davidson for their leadership on the board. I would like to thank Rebecca Patterson for stepping up when we needed it and for Alfred Falk and Brenda Nescaero for staying curious. Okay, I'd also like to especially thank Alara Stefan Gadet for being our passionate DRE for so many years, for staying flexible when we had to adapt their role with Westwood's ever-changing needs. I see your hard work of a committed heart and I salute you. A special thank you to Reverend Ann Barker and her partner, Lori, who have given me guidance, asked interesting questions during community meetings or committee meetings, and has somehow always made me feel like I could find my way back to my heart, no matter how broken I was feeling, or by making me laugh so hard, I snort a milkshake out my nose. As a Unitarian Universalist congregation, we come together each week to learn more what it means to be human, how to stay compassionate through disagreement, how to uphold our principles when they feel challenging and stretch into the discomfort. We're not here because we've figured it out. We're not here because we think we have it right. We come here to learn more what it means to be in relationship, how to listen, how to agree, how to agree to disagree, how to forgive, how to be vulnerable, how to create trust and compassion in one another. I come here to, uh, we come, sorry, we come here to understand ourselves, to give ourselves pause, to think, to feel. We come here to discover just how we can use our power to heal and not to harm, to help and not to hinder. And so I also want to thank each of you for your continued contribution of time and talent to our beloved community. I know this pandemic has made me feel tired and worn thin. I want you to know that I feel rich beyond measure to know each of you. So thank you for showing up this morning from wherever you may be. This is a place where you are invited to rest, to grow, and to serve the world. Welcome, one and all. If you have a chalice or a candle nearby, now is the time to bring it forward. A chalice lighting for liminal times by Summer Elbeete, a UU Muslim of Iraqi descent from the worship web. In betwixt and in between, we move in the liminal spaces that show shades of what can become, what can be. We light this chalice as a symbol of courage to move into that time of this and that, and not this, and not that, with patience and faith and love and hope, that this time will pass like the sun moves in between rising and setting, reminding us that beauty resounds in betwixt and in between. At this time in our service, we pause to reflect on our week. We recall the milestones, the joys, the concerns, and the sorrows, the changes in our lives, and those who need our healing thoughts. Candles of Concern and Celebration is a cherished tradition at Westwood and is done in many different ways adapted for different scenarios. 
I've arranged a chalice cam, a bowl of gems, and some water. You're invited to raise your virtual hand or your physical paw, and I will call on you and ask you to unmute yourself and share your candle aloud. When you're finished, I will place a gem into the bowl of water and call upon the next person. Okay, Alara, can you play for us the beautiful music from Sheila? Please join us in our affirmation on your screen. May the light of these candles inspire us to use our power to heal and not to harm, to help and not to hinder, to serve the spirit of truth in loving affection and trusting hope. Westwood is a self-sufficient community sustained and maintained by its membership. There are many ways to donate or contribute to Westwood, including by volunteering time, sharing your talent, or dining financially. E-transfers can be made to info at westwoodunitarian.ca. Thank you for your generosity and continued support. 
Now let's sing along to Rebecca Patterson. From you I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live, together I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we I am Tania Marquez, and this Braver Wiser is called The Unexpected Sacredness of Things. Nothing here below is profane. On the contrary, everything is sacred. Pierre de l'Arc de Jardin. It was one of those times in life when the wheel of life turned and I found myself in unknown terrain. I had made a difficult decision that was still painful, despite the fact that it was my choice. After leaving a place that had meant a lot to me, I found myself immersed in the fogginess that sometimes comes with the in-between spaces. A week into this liminal space, I received an invitation to participate in a small business market in my city. It was a space offered through a Mexican Chicanex organization, and the day of the event was only a week away. I spent the entire week getting ready for this event, making candles, preparing loose incense, putting together self-care ritual kits. This mindful work created a silence within me that unexpectedly allowed me to process a lot of what I was feeling. I felt saved by this holy work of giving all of my attention to the things that were in front of me. The event was like no other I had been to. I felt welcome and in community as soon as I arrived. I met my neighbor sellers, rejoiced in the music the G DJ was playing, and felt a great sense of pride for being part of the event. Then, right before the market was officially open, we, all the vendors, were invited to join a circle to bless the day and open the market. This ritual and sense of reverence was so unexpected. We called the five directions, north, south, west, east, center. We received a blessing with copal incense and felt a deeper sense of connection and community with the strangers that were now becoming familiar. Now, every month I sign up to go and feel grateful every time I'm invited to be part of it. My teenage daughters also found a place here for them, either helping me or volunteering to help with the event. For a long time, I have believed that the sacred can be found everywhere. Yet, every time I find it unexpectedly, I am filled with awe and surprise. And every time something like this happens, it makes me wonder what sacredness in life I have overlooked, thinking the space was too ordinary, too familiar to be holy. Let's end with a prayer. Divine Creator, may our hearts be always open to see the holy everywhere we are. And may we be filled with joy and awe when we find sacredness in unexpected moments and places. Braver Wiser is one of the great treasures that the Unitarian Universalist Association provides. If you go to the worship web and search Braver Wiser, you can sign up to have these beautiful stories in text and often in audio as well, magically appear on a regular basis in your email box. Um, Erica Hewitt is the curator of the worship web and also of Braver Wiser and their lay people and uh, clergy that create these. If you had any difficulty hearing, I know we turned it up as loud as we could, you can read the text 
at um, braverwiser at uua.org. And if you can't find it easily, um, let me know and I'll send you the link. Liminal spaces. This is an excerpt from a poem by Reverend Kate Walker entitled In Between. In between, liminal, that space where we wait. Between moments, events, reactions, action, no action. To stand on the threshold, waiting for something to end and something new to arrive, a pause in the rumble of time. Awareness claims us, alert, a shadow of something different. In between invitation and acceptance. In between symptom and diagnosis. In between send and receipt of inquiry and question. In between love given and love received. Liminality, a letting go, entering into confusion, ambiguity, and disorientation. A ritual begun. Pause. Look back at what once was. Look forward into what becomes. Identity sheds a layer, reaches into something uncomfortable to wear. In between, storm predicted the horizon beacons. In between, theology of process reminds us to step back. In between, where minutia and galaxies intermingle with microbes and mysteries, in between liminal, that space where we wait, look, listen, feel, breathe. So let's take a moment to breathe. So take the breath that works for you, whether it is deep or just gentle, and we're gonna to breathe together in and out. One more time, in and out. When we breathe together, we regulate ourselves as a group. not only as individuals, but as a whole, a united web for this sacred moment in time. That's one of the things that has been hard about the pandemic is all of the ways that we re-regulate ourselves by being together in a physical space. And we can do some of it in a virtual space like we have just this moment, taking a breath together or lighting a chalice at the same time, things we do in unison. We're always learning how to self-regulate, but we help one another settle into some kind of peace and calm and graceful place when we do things together. When we sing, Together, the resonance carries us, holds us, shifts us. In between, liminal, that space where we wait. Between moments, events, results, action, no action. To stand on the threshold, waiting for something to end and something new to arrive, a pause in the rumble of time. When I was 16 years old, 
my parents announced that we were moving to Nanaimo. We lived in Tawasan. I had done 11 years of school, elementary and through grade 11 in Tawasan. That's where you catch the ferry to Victoria. And we were moving to this place I had never been. I had no choice. It was a complete surprise. My dad had a new job, big upheaval. Think back to when you were in high school and your grade 12 year, that graduating year. I had gone to school with the same people for 11 years. And we were moving somewhere where I knew nobody and I knew nothing. As you can imagine, I was not delighted. I had no idea how to prepare for complete newness. I had changed schools like from elementary to junior high and junior high to senior high, and sometimes different schools would feed in together, but I knew that there would be my clump of humans still there. And suddenly I was gonna be in a place where my clump of humans was just my immediate family. And at 16, they were not always my favorite people. I had no idea how to prepare to enter a new culture. And at the time, I didn't even know it would be a new culture. Tawasan was a suburb of Vancouver and fairly affluent. And Nanaimo was more of a working class uh, harbor city. Strange place, new school, new people, new house, new everything. It felt like a profound loss in my universe. And it was. And the only thing I could do was go. So together we went. I can see historically how hard my parents worked to try to make that better for us. I got to stay in the summer with my grandma, who was my person. So I got that extra bonding time with her and my brother went on ahead with my parents and they bought him a dirt bike so that he could ride in the wild territory behind our property, which is now full of houses and things. But then it was full of trees and deer and wild blackberries. And they worked hard to identify who did they know and did any of them have kids? And one of them had a daughter my age who picked me up for that first day of school. And even though we weren't in any of the same classes, I had that ride to and from where I wasn't alone. But I didn't see any of that at the time. At the time, I just thought I was being tortured. And then a funny thing happened when I got there. I discovered that you get to reinvent yourself when nobody knows you. Now, I was a kid who had struggled with body issues and had never been much of an athlete and hated phys ed classes and hated gym shorts and hated all of that stuff I was no good at. There's no phys ed in grade 12. I didn't have to sweat with these people. Nobody had seen me in gym shorts, which by the way was not a big deal because I was actually a normal sized human, but in my mind, it was a big deal. None of them knew that I carried that trauma with me. I just got to show up as the kid in all those classes, lots of electives in grade 12. I got to be who I was and the things I wanted to grow, I got to focus on and nobody knew that wasn't what I already did before I got there. I had lots of open space because I didn't have familiar things around me. So there was space to be curious and to explore 
And I had to try new things because everything was new. And when it was too much, I would back off a little bit. It didn't change who I was. I was still me. But I came in with a new perception of me. And I got to shape how I wanted to be in this new world. We know that change is constant. We don't always like it, at least not immediately. And it's important to remember that what change brings is undefined. We might write a story about what we expect. I had a bad story in my head. But if you're not attached to the story, it opens things up for possibility. Life is always full of changes and surprises. And we often don't have control. Think about climate destruction and the evasion in Ukraine. And the fact that Alara and I will be leaving at the end of the year. In the book, How to Lead When You Don't Know Where You're Going, Leading in a Liminal Season, author Susan Beaumont writes about how to find the importance and value in a liminal season. So liminal is literally the threshold. It's that space where you're standing with one foot in this moment and the other one is reaching and you don't know exactly where it's going to land. It's anxiety producing. Even when it's a good change, even when you picked it, even when you're happy about it, it can be raising all kinds of feelings within us. And the task is not to rush into the solution. The task is to be present in the feeling to find out what's happening there, to discover what you're carrying, what you're dreaming, to understand that it's an open, unsettled space. So Beaumont says, we have to figure out what do we do with our anxiety when we're in a liminal space? Why do we feel the ways we feel? And so the first thing we need to do is give ourselves permission to notice our feelings and to notice them, our, our anxiety and our feelings without judgment, without deciding they're good or bad or right or wrong or have to be or shouldn't be, just permission to notice your feelings. Sometimes in a tense space, we want to stuff our feelings or medicate our feelings or outrun our feelings. And sometimes those strategies help for a moment when we're overwhelmed, but they don't hold us in the long run. So the trick is to stay in that present moment. We will be thinking to what has gone before and imagining what comes ahead but the tricky piece is to stay at that threshold place. Let it settle within you. The past and the future vision can be traps that take us out of the actual knowing. The third thing we need to remember is you do not have to save the world. An uncertain space can make us feel like, oh, crap, I have to solve this. And all we're really doing is working the threads of our experience one step at a time. We don't need the miracle answer in a moment.
And the next thing is to trust the helpers. Remember, Mr. Rogers tells us to look for the helpers. And when you can, to be a helper. To help add strength and help carry the tension. But to remember that being a helper in this exact moment is to hold the space, not to solve it. In a few moments, I'm gonna invite you to reflect on what's an example of liminal space from your life that has informed or could inform your future. I'll give you an example. You may have heard me tell the story about being in a vehicle accident when I was a young adult. How I was flying through the air and I thought, I'm going to die. And I was surprised to discover that I was not afraid. And that piece of information has shaped how I understand my life and my mortality. You've all been through transitions, chosen and surprises. Within every life experience is a hint about who we are. Sometimes information like that can help us moving forward. Sometimes information that we don't like comes up. And then we can realize ways that we need to shift in our own understanding of ourselves or the world. We might not be proud of how we handled every challenge and want to learn new skills for the next time. We might be inspired by the resources we discovered that welled up inside us in a challenging moment. And all of these things can happen at once. You may not think of your experiences this way automatically. Like, what does it mean for my life? this thing that happened. But that's what we do here. We reflect and we dig for the meaning and we shape our reality with both information and intention. This is one way that we discover, like Reverend Marquez described, the unexpected sacredness of things. We weave the web of interdependence with purpose and we care for one another and care for ourselves. So what is an example of a liminal space, that transition time from your life that has informed your future? What do you know about yourself that you have learned from transitional times? You can type in the chat, or if you'd like to speak out loud, just wave a paw. We'd be happy to hear from you. What do you know about yourself that you have learned from some transition that you've been through? I can do hard stuff. I can't control the outcome. Yeah. That time moves on anyway. Right. I can move. In 1984, on the verge of coming out, knowing I wasn't straight, but afraid to say I'm gay. Separation time from my first husband, limbo, liminal, and finally realizing that it was time to decide yes or no about the marriage. That some changes can be exciting in its unknownness. You think enforced change is going to be awful, but in truth, it's an opportunity Oops, I lost my place, and lead to much better things than you could possibly imagine. I already have everything I need from life 
loving others and being loved. That there's no point in resisting change. The more things change, the more they stay the same and go with the flow. I have enough space inside me to hold all the feelings and continue to expand. Thank you. Think about all the ways that we've ritualized these transitional spaces. When somebody gets married, their friends throw them a party, either separately as individual spouses or together. And it's marking that moment of transition from before to married life. A baby shower where we shower a new mom with advice and gifts in the whole getting ready moment, except we know you can't ever be ready for that. Here's another one. The ability to give up something cherished in order to create new and unknown opportunities. Becoming a widow and organizing myself, yes. Liminality, a letting go, entering into confusion, ambiguity and disorientation. A ritual begun, pause, look back at what once was, look forward into what becomes. Identity sheds a layer, reaches into something uncomfortable to wear. We don't know the meaning of an experience until we create it. Sometimes it's obvious in the moment, but so often we create deep meaning later when we peel back our layers of understanding. My experience of moving for that final year of high school turned out to be huge and taught me so much about myself and how I experience life. And some of the lessons being things that I wouldn't or couldn't understand until later in life when I experienced how they would apply to future situations. I learned that the grass isn't greener or browner on the other side. It's still grass, it's just different. I learned that I could make new relationships even from a cold start. That was huge for a kid who had always been surrounded by things and people they knew. I gained opportunities I wouldn't have had back home because my identity was more shaped within that system. In my new system, you'd be surprised to know I was seen as a bit of a troublemaker. And with another girl, we led a walkout, rallied by a rogue English teacher, of course. I would never have had that experience in my little suburban high school. I learned that I could shift between cultures. You don't have to have it all figured out to make a change or to make it through a change. In fact, you can't have it all figured out. And if you try to control the experience by holding on tightly, those parts will get stuck or compacted or they will burst apart like when we try to hold a balloon underwater. I spent the weekend in a minister's meeting with um, the Reverend Dr. Elizabeth Stevens, who was talking about trauma-informed worship. And this was organized because we were thinking about the collective trauma that all congregations have gone through with the pandemic. And then we add layers on for our unique experiences. She led us through this simple exercise, so I hope you will do it with me. So I want you to take a fist, Take a hand and make a fist as tight as you can, right? Tight, tight little fist. Hold it tight. Now I want you to use your other hand and try to pry it open. See what happens? 
Do you feel how the tension in your body increases? Like for me, my shoulders and my neck just locked up. It's really hard. Or I have to start snapping parts to get it to do what I want, right? Okay, shake it out. Make that fist again, tight as you can. Now hold it, just support it with the other hand. Let your shoulders come down. What happens inside you? There's a breath. My inclination is to relax those fingers in the tight hand a little bit. We want to hold tight to what we know. And then if we get anxious, we want to pry it open. Have you ever had that experience with someone you love who's in real distress and you just want to pry it open? You just want to help them like crack that nut, get it open, relax. And you know what happens, right? Like when you try to pry that kid open in their moment of distress or something, that never goes well. I thought that advice to just hold one another and to hold ourselves was really beautiful advice. This works in moments of things like our distress around Ukraine as well. We can't solve that here today. We can't pry it open. But when we hold it, just hold those people in our hearts and our minds and our bodies and our prayers and our intentions. Look at all the ways people have found to contribute, to send love and support and resources and gifts. My mom didn't have the same experience of the move that I had. She'd been excited to start something new. It was a good time in our family life and in, our, in her marriage. But then her mother died unexpectedly the day after my grandpa brought me home. And while she knew they were gonna be separated by an ocean, my mom had been counting on those daily phone calls and the letters that they would share to help her through that transition. Her heartache led to isolating and numbing behaviors and developed into a deep depression. She didn't have a support system in her new community yet. She hadn't yet found a church or friends or practices that would help her shape meaning during this difficult time. Her mom was her everything. It took her a long time and professional help to find ways to be present with her loss and then to move through it. So what do we do with our anxiety? Why do we feel the ways we feel? We need permission to notice our feelings and our anxiety without judgment. We need ways and tools to help us and to help one another stay in the present moment. You did that this weekend with the small group gatherings. It's an ideal example of how we can hold one another, let the anxiety and the nervousness bubble up and just remind each other that there are more of us, that you're not alone, that people have been through this before, that this too will pass. We remember we don't have to save the world, at least not today. And then we can find ways to participate and invest and help and support. And we need to find the helpers and trust the helpers and be a helper when we're able but be honest with yourself when you ask what can i do don't forget to ask 
what can I, what do I need? Because if you invest yourself only in caring for the others, there's nothing caring for you. In any change, especially complex ones, conflicts will surface, old stories will return, mumbly messes come up, let them move through. Think about those meditation instructions. Sure, thoughts will come up, notice them, let them move through. Don't grab a hold and get attached. And don't guard yourself against experiences and feelings. My father was in a profoundly challenging experience when we moved and then my grandma died. And his expectations turned on their head. He was starting a brand new job that required him to travel a lot. His kids were starting in new schools and he was counting on my mom, the stay at home rock to support all of us, to help us through. And there she was alone in the house all day while we were out meeting new people and being busy with work and school, and she was alone with her heartbreak. Her primary support was gone. And she needed help in ways that she couldn't even understand or articulate. And because she was typically very independent and strong, it took her an extra long time to be willing to receive help. And when she realized that she needed help, she still didn't even know what to ask for or who to ask. So don't forget the independent ones. And don't forget the strong ones. help one another through a liminal phase is to normalize the experience, to recognize that all of these experiences and feelings are normal and to be expected. One of the most difficult things about liminality for people is that we tend to think of it as undesirable or aberrant. People can often frame the whole experience as a failure, either organizational or personal, because we all tend to feel anxious or concerned when people around us aren't feeling happy or safe. So Beaumont reminds us that people expect to move in a straight line from old things to new things, and that the waiting and confusion feels meaningless and counterproductive. But the in-between spaces are where the magic often happens. To help one another, we need to remember the importance and value of a liminal season, why we're feeling the way we're feeling and what we can do with our anxiety. Do you know one of the things I learned in this workshop this weekend is that repetitive motion has a calming effect. Rocking. has a calming effect. Isn't that funny? I just started rocking when I said that. The speaker was talking about how culturally we all had repetitive motion activities that we did that we don't necessarily do anymore. We knit the socks, we carded the wool, we chopped the wood. All of these repetitive motion things, if you find yourself suddenly undertaking a craft project, that's nurturing and healing in this moment. One of the ways we can help one another is just to suspend judgment and to simply be curious. Curious, curiosity allows us to feel and imagine without needing to have it all figured out. It lowers the pressure. 
Beaumont writes, wonder is the ability to suspend judgment and hold competing thoughts and values in tension. Wonder arrives when we acknowledge that experience is always larger than our ability to interpret it. We hold other, our interpretations more loosely and ponder the interpretations of others. In a state of wonder, we perceive the organization or our personal situation from its edges and boundaries rather than from the center. Remember we talked about how we're not actually the center of the interdependent web. A couple of weeks ago, we're a part of it. If we watch from the edges, we learn things we don't know when we're not centering ourselves. We develop a rich capacity for challenging unstated assumptions and seeing things with fresh eyes. My mom, thought it was her job to always be happy and to take care of us. And when she couldn't make herself be happy and or couldn't live up to her ideals of mothering, she felt like she was failing at her roles in the family and that only compounded her grief and her trauma. The gift of community is that we hold one another in tender times, we support one another. We renegotiate the roles and we share the tasks. And when it's all too much, as it sometimes is, we sit together and have a cry. Often followed by memories of past transformations success and failure and conflict and resolution stories. And we give permission to laugh at our blunders. We forgive our own and one another's mistakes. And we reimagine the path forward. It may strengthen exactly who we think or know we are or it may shift our identities. Beaumont writes that a new start is not synonymous with a new beginning. The new start happens in response to an event. The building is opened, the new pastor arrives, the new worship service begins, a new beginning, so that's a new start. A new beginning happens when the people are spiritually and emotionally ready to move out of liminality and into a new chapter of life. Keep in mind as you reflect on your experiences here that beyond Westwood, the whole idea of institutional church is also in a liminal season. And COVID has compounded this so all faith communities right now are reflecting on what they have been in the past and how they might imagine moving into the future, but currently all congregations are in a state of unknowing, a state of shifting identity, a liminal space. This is even more reason to not be in a hurry to solve Westwood to allow the emotions and ideas that arise in transition to do just that, to arise, without needing to make all the decisions at once, without holding too tightly onto the past or racing too quickly toward a vision for the future. So to lead through this transition, your questions are, who am I? What? is being called forth from this congregation? How then shall I lead or help? Hold one another in care and support. I'm here with you until late June. I am willing to sit with you and hold space for you and hear whatever it is that you need to speak into the liminal space. Together in this moment, the work is to check in with feelings, 
find awareness of our concerns and dreams and hopes and fears, to stay in the present moment with things like meditation or sustaining and spiritual practices or ritual, to find your own place in this experience, which is unique to you. Who do you choose to be in this moment? And to remember at the center that all is fundamentally well. In liminal spaces, we want, we tend to want to clutch on to something and hold it tight, but the secret is to hold this time lightly. To not let go, to care for your spirit, but not let the anxiety that will rise, not to grip it so tightly into one single story that you can experience nothing else. Care for your spirit. Honor the interdependence of community and of life without having to solve it. Just do the next right thing. Blessed be. forward and spotlight that chalice cam with patience and faith and love and hope that this time will pass like the sun that moves in between rising and setting reminding us that beauty resounds in betwixt and in between. Blessed be. Thank you everyone for joining us this morning. Our next service next week, our service leader is Lisa Stein, and our guest speaker will be Alara Stefan Gadet. And it is not their usual service. The service is a work that grew out of a presentation that Alara gave to the Accessibility Advisory Committee for the City of Edmonton. Alara will be speaking from their heart about their heartfelt exploration of some of the intersections between disability justice. Re reconciliation and decolonization. Breakout rooms will appear momentarily. Happy Sunday, everyone. We still have a closing song. Oh, we still have a closing song. I do this every time. <laughs> Alara, will you play the closing song and pretend I said it and not in the wrong order? <laughs>
this is what happens when we have a chalice cam because usually I have my script here and you people there and I don't have another thing and I don't want to waste paper so do you want me to re-say it again this service no, we, you, we're good we love you it's okay. all okay wonderful do, do come next week for this unique fantastic piece of professional work that Alara has done and is going to share with you at at my request. <laughs>